Welcome to TechSoup Talks. My name is Candy Griffiths, and today's webinar is Make It Easy to Give, Taking Online Donations. We've got a couple of great presenters here today. We have Chris Dumas and Alex Cahayas. I'd like to first introduce, uh, have Chris introduce himself. So Chris, if you don't mind um, telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, so my name is Chris Dumas. I, uh, in the past, have co-founded Donor Tools, which is an online donor management tool and currently consult and help nonprofits with their online donations and fundraising. Great. Thank you for presenting today. And Alex, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and Komodo? Sure. Um, my name is Alex Gahayas. I'm Product Manager at Komodo. Uh, we work to create trust online, so that includes security-related products, compliance-related products. Um, and we've established a great relationship with TechSoup, which we'll be discussing a little bit later. Excellent. Thank you. So first to quickly go through the agenda, uh, we'll, we're going to start with talking about what should be considered before taking online donations, and then spending some time about the different options for taking donations through your website, how you make it secure, what's required uh, when doing donations, constituent fundraising, we'll explain that further, online donations, and other strategies for raising money online, as well as how do you market um, and conduct outreach once you get your online channel set up. So what I'd like to do now is take a little poll of the audience, and see where people are at. So if you wouldn't mind taking a second to click on which option is most applicable to you. Are you taking online donations through your website? Yes, no, not sure. And the not sure can also be it doesn't quite work. <laughs> I was not sure if I wanted to add that in there, but I know that um, there might be some folks kind of in limbo. And it's not a bad thing, so I'm glad that you're here to, to learn more. Give it another second for people to respond. And here we go. So the majority of folks are not currently taking online donations. So thank you for, for that. It's nice for us to – oh, can you guys see it out there? Send in a chat message if you – for the presenters, can you guys see the message? Okay, great. Well, um, for those of you who might not be able to see it, it has 36% of you yes have a website, ha, take online donations, 62% aren't, and 2.2% of you are not sure. So what I'd like to do first is start by asking um, Chris, what should be considered when thinking about taking online donations? Yeah, I'd love to take that question. Uh, so nonprofits have a lot of things to factor into this, right? You need to understand uh, what does the online donation component need to do? Is it just taking donations really quickly and simply? Are your demographics of, uh, skewed towards younger people who are going to be doing that? Um, and where does it need to go? So does it need to involve social media? Does it need to involve mobile applications? Uh, or is it just on your website? Uh, you know, in addition to that, you're going to start looking at like administration. So how does the data and the money flow? And making sure that you're compliant. Um, and you're going to factor in things like cost of transactions. Uh, with the cost of usability. There's some uh, wonderful products and some products that aren't very usable. And if they're not usable, you leave a lot of money on the table. Um, so understanding how that factors into it. So one of the things that I always tell people to do is sit down and write out what they really want to do. What's your spec sheet? Uh, you know, are we dealing with international transactions? transactions? Sit down, write it out before you go shopping and looking at what's going to really work well for your organization. Okay, great. Thanks for that, that overview. And um, someone, and just so you know, there's a lot of content in this hour. We're going to go through a lot of stuff and not necessarily very deep into, into each um, avenue. So we'll be following up with lots of other resources for you to continue doing research on these topics. So um, if you have some questions, please post those to the chat, and we'll address those um, at the end. We've got 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. But now I'd like to continue with Chris and say, you know, if I do want to take – I've done this spec, and I, and I know I want to, to take online donations via my website, what are the options? And I'd first like Chris to talk about third-party vendors. Yeah, so there's a lot of third-party vendors. I mean, hundreds and I mean, maybe even a thousand, right? But these are the main players, at least in our space. Uh, and you're going to know, like PayPal. PayPal actually has three or four different products um, that it offers. 
Uh, and they're, they're going to change in terms of cost uh, and implementation. Uh, Google Checkout, so I don't know if anybody out there has a Google, is a Google Grants recipient, but Google Checkout has a, a wonderful uh, API which means it plugs into everything really nice. Um, but it, it's free if you're a Google Grant recipient. There's a zero transaction fee. Uh, there's also Amazon Payments which does uh, a pretty good job of you know, using that uh, simple pay uh, button on your website. Uh, and th there's two others. And these are probably really relevant and prominent in our space because they're, they're actually nonprofits and they're a donor advised fund. So they make sure that you're compliant and offer a lot of best practices. And those are both Just Give and Network for Good. And both of those offer uh, free packages with a, a transactional uh, fee. So all of these, when you're looking at them, there's going to be a fee involved, maybe a little bit of a monthly fee. Mostly they're a uh, percentage between you know, 1.5% to say 5%. Um, you need to be looking at the emails and follow-up. So how do you send them a receipt uh, for their transaction with your 501c3 tax ID number? Um, how is that following into your CRM product or donor management product? Um, and how are you sending you know, your, just your thank you letters? Um, and quite often if you're taking that data from those transactions, you're going to be, want to be able to run like a report and put it in a, a CSV file or a spreadsheet. Uh, most of these products do that. Um, and you know, Alex will talk a little bit more about compliance and integration with some of the stuff that he's doing. Um, when it comes to integration, a lot of times you're, you're Website has a, like a donation form. Uh, let me double click on 10. There you go. So uh, a donation form is kind of like that point of sale, your e-commerce page, right? When people go to your website, they hit a, a big old donate button. This is where it should be taking them. And donation forms need to be really easy to use. This is where you make money, right? Uh, so making sure that you're collecting the right information, suggesting the right giving levels, um, and there's some easy ways to do this with those third-party tools. So there's things like Network for Good which offer a custom Donate Now uh, package. And they offer a really great branded, uh, trustworthy uh, portal like on the, the left of your screen. And then something like Wufu and Formstack. Now these are products that aren't donation processors. They're not transaction processors. They're uh, form builders. And what you can do with them is build up a donation form or an event registration form. And it ties into uh, Google Checkout, PayPal, Authorize.net, and a lot of the uh, third-party um, transaction processors. So uh, these are good options if you're trying to build up something custom uh, that has you know, an email back to them. If your organization is on Twitter, you can automatically tweet them if you're collecting that uh, Twitter ID uh, in the form. So uh, those are both really easy ways to get up and have a, a really usable, easy uh, form. Very good. Thank you so much, Chris. Now Alex, if you could share with us um, if people wanted to have the donate page directly on their site, um, not through PayPal or another third-party vendor, what's the process? What do they need to be doing and thinking about? Sure, absolutely. So we'll be going over the last option here, which is more of a do-it-yourself type model. Um, basically what it's all about is control, right? You're going to have end-to-end -end control of the complete customer's experience, in this case your donors. Um, and at the end of the day, you really are competing against a lot of different things that could take a share of a person's wallet. Um, I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean that you are fighting over a share of how much money people have to donate in certain areas. So it's really important to optimize to the point where you're getting the most out of it and converting at a high level. And by conversion, I mean literally turning visitors into donors. Um, so the do-yourself route gives you a little bit more options and flexibility um, to fully integrate the experience into your website. Um, granted, it's a little bit more complex in setting up, but if you're doing the work of setting up a payment gateway anyway, um, these things will allow you to take complete control over it. Okay, so what are the pros of this? Basically, you're giving more payment options. Um, not all of the vendors, including PayPal, um, will take all different credit card options. There's also a certain percentage of people who will not transact using PayPal. 
Um, even the thought of using PayPal, someone will get turned off to um, and may not choose to donate. That's one thing we want to avoid, right? So giving people options is a great thing. So oftentimes in the e-commerce world, which I'm most fluent in, um, people will provide different ways for you to pay. Um, that may include PayPal, that may include Amazon payments, but also taking transactions directly on your website. It makes it feel very professional, and if you do it the right way, you can optimize the customer's experience to make the most out of it. Um, other things you can do, obviously recurring donations. I know a bunch of the third parties also do that. If you need to customize that, uh, maybe it, you don't want it monthly, may, maybe you want it on a certain schedule, or when certain events happen, uh, you have complete control over it because you're fully utilizing the payment gateway the, the way you want to. So it really comes down to your imagination of how you really want your donor program or your membership program to work. So what are the cons to that? Um, obviously, it's a little bit more complex. It's going to cost a little bit more upfront, more investment to set up and run. So when you're factoring in your decisions and looking at all the different ways to take donations online, one thing you definitely have to consider if you're purely going to do this yourself is the investment upfront as well as maintaining it. Right? So with PayPal, you don't really have to worry about your form breaking one day. Not necessarily, unless you're going a super integrated route with them. Um, but if you're hosting and managing your pages, your donation pages yourself, there is a chance that things could go wrong. And at the end of the day, you want to make sure you have very available and always working. So if people want to give you money, you're not saying no. Um, it's also going to require some more skilled resources. Um, you have some back-end development that may need to be done. Uh, Chris mentioned a couple of different things, um, integrating it into a various customer relationship management software, um, but also being able to control what actually happens from an account management perspective too. So skilled resources in terms of you need someone who can design the pages, who understands usability, um, as well as someone who understands how payment gateways work, how to get them set up, and if something goes wrong, how to fix them. Um, the other point I want to uh, go over is the higher security requirements. The minute you start taking payments directly on your website, and what I mean by that, um, if you were to go to a donation page, when you go to donate, is the URL the URL of your website? So if I'm, if I'm on Komodo.com and I want to make a donation, when I go to, jo to donate, it doesn't say Komodo.com. Um, some people use a third-party route, which is great, kicks you out to a separate page, let's say on PayPal, they're a great, great example of it, and then it takes you back. But in that case, you're not hosting that page. So when you host it, you're immediately taking the responsibility. Um, so I do want to go over a couple options for that as well. So let's talk about what you'd actually need to get this stuff set up. So if you're starting purely from scratch, right, and again, the object here is control. You want complete control over this user experience. Um, in order to get set up, there's a couple of things you have to get away, out of the way anyway, which is a merchant account that's handled through a merchant bank, um, a merchant ID, which is basically your unique identification, um, a payment gateway, the people who are actually going to allow you to take credit card payments um, and also get those things authorized, and then there's web developer. You're definitely going to need a web developer for this. Some of the third-party tools are wonderful and usable because they allow you to get away with things without necessarily all the skilled labor that you might if you were doing a custom job here. But my recommendation is if you're going down this do-it-yourself route, you recognize that you want control. You want to put it in the hands of someone who's very skilled and can make the most of it. Um, and then on, on top of that, you're going to need to give indicators of you having a secure donation experience. So what I want to talk about next is really not about security. It's really about trust. Okay, trust is a touchy subject, especially when it comes to payments online and especially when it comes to the nonprofit sector. We're all aware that there's fraud out there. Nobody does not know anything about fraud. Some people have even experienced it firsthand. Right? So what I want to talk about is trust because at the end of the day, that's the currency that's going to drive donation pages um, and your nonprofit success. Okay, so how do you know that someone is trustworthy? There's a mental check that goes on. Maybe you don't even realize it, but there's several things you're looking at. Everything from the consistency of the website, how well does it look, how professional is it, your gut feeling of whether they're trustworthy, and also some of the other implied ones, like seeing what's called trust marks. We all see this every day when we go to an e-commerce website. You go there, you see a little thing that says, this is SSL secured, or this is secure and authentic, this has been scanned for vulnerabilities, all these are indicators. You may not notice them until, until me just bringing them up, but they do have an effect. 
So when I'm talking about taking control in and, and this do-it-yourself model, what I'm also implying is that you get access to use these tools to their fullest. So things like trust marks that you see here um, on the screen right now, including several from Komodo, these are indicators to people who are about to make donations or even before they hit the donation page that this is a secure and authentic website. There's two elements to this. You have SSL certificates. I don't want to confuse anyone by going into the technical detail of what an SSL certificate actually is, but it delivers two powerful things. And from them you get trust. You have authentication and you have encryption. Authentication is very simple. You are who you say you are. Komodo is one of the excellent certificate authorities that is vetting people to make sure that the person on the other end that you're about to give your credit card to is who they say they are. That's very important. But what is also important is encryption. Not only do you know, who you, you know the other party on the other line, but you're also encrypting it so only they have access to it. And those two things combined is what creates trust, and it's an essential part to anything. So if you go the do-it-yourself route, you're hosting these pages yourself, you better believe you're going to need an SSL certificate, not only because everyone requires it, and in order to be compliant you must have that, but it's a sign of credibility. People have been trained to look for things like the gold padlock, security seals, and things like that. Okay, so the next part, security seals. Visual reassurance to help improve conversion rates. We're opening up the toolkit that you see every day in e-commerce. There's no reason why this doesn't apply when it comes to the nonprofit sector. These indicators help people get from not making donation to actually making donation. These are proven to work and it's very effective. Let's just run over a couple quick statistics about it. Right, 78% of online shoppers say that a seal indicates that their information is secure. 88% of U.S. online shoppers say it's important for any e-commerce entity to include a trust mark of some kind. There's plenty of ways to build trust, but people are definitely looking for them. Okay, so let's explain a little of the elements of some of these trust marks. Just about all of them will have some, some form or another of interaction. This is a stat that comes directly from Komodo. Uh, we deal with this every day. So there's 10 million interactions happening with this stuff every month. People engage in it. We know that. Okay, we track that. And it's because people have this desire to address your security concerns. So again, when it comes to the donating online, it's no different than if you were an e-commerce store. So you're addressing those concerns about security. Um, you're also making sure that it can't be spoofed, right? This stuff can't be copied because it comes from one central area. And just about all the trust marks you see out there do it. Okay, and SSL certificates, of course, are extremely important to compliance, and we're going to discuss TCI compliance in a few seconds. All right, I'm going to give it a great example right now of how a donation page can be effectively put together in a do-it-yourself sort of way. Um, these, uh, these folks have set up Barack Obama's official donation page, right? Some of you may have even donated to it. Um, it's the prime example because it's been the most successful online fundraising tool ever, right? So ever, ever, ever. Um, it takes card payments directly on the website. It doesn't utilize other third-party tools. They've built a custom um, design for it. It gets integrated directly through them. It's also secured by Komodo. So if you do go to Barack Obama's donation page and you find it, you're going to see this little seal on the bottom right here, Komodo Authentic Site. Right? Why? Because even Barack Obama needs a little push sometimes to let people know that this website is for real and these donations are correct. Right? So everybody needs this. It's not a level playing field, unfortunately. Just because you guys are a nonprofit, you have a great story, and you have, you're offering some great service, um, people don't necessarily know that upfront that you're trustworthy. So these seals help people get over that hurdle. And again, this great example, even Barack Obama's official website needs that help too. Okay, let's talk about what's required to take online donations. Okay, there's a couple of things you're also opening yourself up to. I said earlier that you in initially need to invest a little bit more upfront to get this thing effectively working. Okay, so PCI compliance. PCI stands for Payment Card Industry, and compliance means that, well, you better comply. Um, it's an important note to make is that this is not a legal regulation, right, but it is required for you to take payments. So if you're doing this yourself, you have to make sure that you are PCI compliant. The good news, though, for those folks who use third parties or are considering third parties, is that PCI compliance is going to be handled by PayPal, for instance, or Amazon. They will take care of it, which takes you gently out of scope of some of the things you would have to do 
if you go down the do-it-yourself approach. Um, basically, you have to be compliant if you're doing any of the following. Storing, receiving, transmitting credit card data. Okay, that, that's really anything, right? Um, there's 12 requirements that need to be met, and if you need more information about it and you feel that you might go down this do-it-yourself route and host these pages yourself, you're going to want to stay up to date on what PCI compliance is and how you achieve it. Um, I will be sharing some resources also uh, with TechSoup to forward on to you guys about that as well. Um, basically, you have to validate your compliance also quarterly, and there's two other elements you have to do. Perform a vulnerability scan from an approved scanning vendor. That's the acronym ASV. And you also have to complete an SAQ annually. The SAQ is a self-assessment questionnaire. Okay, those two elements need to be done in order to validate your compliance. So you can say, hey, Mr. Merchant Bank, hey, Mr. Payment Provider, I am compliant. Um, otherwise, you may face things like fines. Okay, and then lastly, I want to talk about what TechSoup is offering and providing. We have an excellent partnership that was set up with TechSoup where we provide heavily discounted and donated products that are essential for everyday trust and security online. That includes SSL certificates with the security fields that I've been discussing, uh, as well as PCI vulnerability scanning for those who choose to go down the do-yourself route. Um, for more information, obviously we'll be following up with um, additional documents that you guys can take a look at. Um, and I guess that's it for me then. Great. Thanks, Alex, so much for that information. And Alex will be available for Q&A at the end, so feel free to send those questions in via the chat. And so now I'd like to turn it back over to Chris and find out, um, so let's say I have a people in my community who have offered to help raise money on our behalf. What are the tools available to help with this process? Yeah, so let me jump back. So let's say you are using PayPal or Network for Good or one of these other things. A lot of times they tie into other tools. Uh, and these tools are spread across many different applications. Uh, so to come back to distributed fundraising and people fundraising on your behalf, it's kind of like multi-level marketing. Okay? You, you go out and you, you talk to one of your donors or constituents, and they're going to go ask their friends to donate money uh, to your organization. So there's lots of tools that allow you to do this. Uh, some of them are really great uh, at doing <laughs> both fundraising, but also gathering new people into the organization uh, and establishing new relationships. Uh, so th there, there's a bunch of them. I'm going to talk about a couple um, today. So first up I've got – where's my mouse? It's First Giving. Now First Giving has been along, around in the space for quite some time. And what First Giving does is it's creating a uh, very nice fundraising page uh, for, well, in this case, me. Uh, and it's hosted on firstgiving.com. Uh, and actually, if you want to go to it on your web browser, you can go firstgiving.com slash Chris Dumas, and you'll see this very nice page in my picture. Uh, and you can guide your constituents to go create a page and fundraise, uh, and that, that the money flows back to your organization, um, and you kind of have some guide star compliance and uh, verification that it is going to the right organization. Um, but it's really usable. So, uh, you talk about trying to create something that's uh, simple to use. Uh, there's, there's some great fees in hiring developers and a team uh, and making sure you're compli compliant. First Giving handles that um, and does a very good job at it. Uh, so there's a, First Giving has been around for a long time. Stay Classy is a startup. And they're brand spanking new. I think they, they're still in beta. Um, but they're a public beta, so you can access it. So if you are an early adopter, this might be an option for you. Uh, in fact, they're getting featured in TechCrunch uh, Disrupt, uh, which is a big conference about uh, – people are asking about price. So these are all transactional revenue-based. So I think for skipping 7.5%, uh, Stay Classy I think is a 2% uh, and a, a little bit of a per-transaction fee. Uh, Stay Classy. Same thing, you build your fundraising pages. You can embed video and uh, photos, and it, it engages with your uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts as a user. Uh, it's still hosted up on the First Giving site, uh, or sorry, Stay Classy site, so it's not branded and connected, um, but it's still there and out there on the social web, right? Um, 
so they are a startup, and it, you know you need to test these out. They're great for events, um, but you know jump into it knowing that they are a startup. Um, but the nice part about that is you normally can pick up the phone and call their CEO, and, and he'll answer. So uh, the other part of distributed fundraising is widgets. So let's say your uh, nonprofit that saves puppies has a, uh, a bunch of bloggers that love the cause. And they're all going to jump in and <laughs> embed a widget into their blog. Uh, they can do that really easily using the chip-in widget uh, maker. Uh, and it integrates with PayPal. Um, and so you enter in your PayPal email address, and you can get this widget. And it can go on your website. It can go on blogs. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. You just copy a little bit of code and uh, paste it, and it handles compliance. So another uh, company, and th this one really is different uh, than First Giving and Stay Classy, because they're not transactional revenue based for the most part. Okay? So they do both your event registration and your organization uh, events. Like, uh, you know, you're doing your gala and you want to charge a $50 ticket. They'll handle that, but they'll also handle that friends asking friends, team raiser type model. Okay? So you can plug in your own uh, payment gateway. So uh, you can plug in authorize.net or PayPal, or uh, I think they have like a list of 10 or so. Um, and it, so it's a little bit of a different business model. You might pay a, a monthly fee um, for access to those tools, but you're not paying any transactional revenue. Very good. So there was a question that came through. It's hard to keep track of all these widgets. I totally agree. And um, you, will, you will be receiving a copy of this PowerPoint afterwards. So um, don't, don't feel overwhelmed. There are a lot of tools out there, and we're only scratching the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> There's like, so many out there. Um, but this gives you an idea of what some of the options are. I'd like to now find out about online options. Um, can you tell me about the process and the tools that are available? Yeah. So, uh, I can hear myself again. So online auctions, there's tons and tons of tools. Okay? I mean, somebody just wrote in the chat that there's all these things they hope to get the slides. There's so many tools and all of this stuff. Here's the main players in the online auction space. Uh, we'll start with Mission Fish. Uh, they do some eBay transactions um, and kind of like a, an online store. Um, same with Bidding for Goods. I mean, they're both really put up there as an online store. You can take donations or in-kind donations. So let's say somebody gave you a, a case of wine and a signed magnum. You can take that and put it up and auction it off. Okay? Win-win apps is another startup. They launched at the AFP conference. Um, they are uh, really neat because what they do is they do the online auction component. They do a little bit of an event registration component. But they also do, uh, let's say you have a, like a silent auction at your event, and you're tying online auctions to your silent auctions and live auctions. Um, they handle that. Uh, they are transactional revenue or transaction fee based. And so you can either plug in your own and pay, you know, I think a 1%, uh, or you can use theirs and it's a 3%. Um, so, you know, uh, all of them are good options. You need to go play with the tools and make sure they're the right fit, they have the right feel, the right branding. Um, and then you need to make sure that your, your constituents will use them. Uh, a lot of times, you know, a, a volunteer will think, hey, this is a great idea. Make sure that it gets used and uh, kind of kick it around and play around with it. Very good. Now we've talked about the constituents raising money for us and online auctions, so, um, as well as the buttons on our website. What are some other options that we haven't yet discussed? Other, other methods. So uh, as everybody at TechSoup knows, the world is changing so fast online. Um, Google search or – sorry, there's something called Good Search. Uh, there's a couple of products in the space, but the idea is uh, you can make money for an organization as you're searching the web. Uh, with searching and search 
based fundraising campaigns, uh, you know, double check that people are going to use it and make sure it's a good ask of your constituents that they're going to install it and do it. There's quite a, uh, it, you know, it does take a, some time and commitment to change uh, browsing behavior. Uh, there's other things like micropayments, right? These have been kind of really trending topics um, because you can fundraise on Twitter, right? Uh, there's something called TwitPay, which is pretty prominent in the space. Uh, and they have a, a retweet kind of invo invoice thing. So um, if somebody retweets a message, they'll send them a reminder to bill, some, bill them uh, for you know, X amount. Um, there's a lot of them out there. Again, you need to make sure that that works with your constituents. Um, you know, if you're, if you're uh, dealing with people who are retired 70 plus and they're not really active Twitter users, probably not a good use of your resources to go all in on it. The, uh, the other spot that's really changing is the mobile web, right? How are you, how are you handling all this stuff on your, your cell phone? Um, and how does the online start meeting offline, right? Because now not only am I able to access your website on my iPhone, I, I'm able to go to your event I'm accessing your website, and I'm you know, maybe checking in on Foursquare. Well, there's some really neat terminal apps, right? And what I'm saying by terminal apps is you know, if you have an iPhone, you can download them and plug in, say, your authorized.net account. And you can start processing transactions there on the spot, um, kind of like if you had a credit card machine. Uh, this can save an organization tons of time and resources and data entering. Uh, and it's, you know, Makes, makes life easy. Um, so that's one of the things that's starting to change quite a bit. And if you are doing a lot of events or you're doing uh, things on that mobile web, uh, it's worth investigating a little bit more. Very good. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to talking about getting the word out because we know that if you put the button there, people aren't just going to run to your website and start donating. So let's talk about how do you market and get the word out that you've got these pages up and that people can donate. Yeah, so uh, whether you use one of those third-party uh, widgets or uh, campaigns or uh, transaction providers like PayPal and Network for Good, or you built your own, you're going to have a donation form or some place to take those donations. You might actually have a couple uh, based on your landing pages, right? So it's really important that you're, you know, I, when we got this original slide deck, it's like, how do I fundraise with my email? And how do I fundraise with social media? Well, the, the answer is a lot of it is, how do you guide traffic that's relevant? Uh, so I'm on your Facebook page, and I think, you know what? I love the fact that they have this, uh, you know, great video of a cute baby tiger. I really want to support baby tigers and, you know, help this cause. So I click on their link to support them through their Facebook page, and it guides me to that donation form. Okay? Uh, you're gonna, as you go in through your online marketing and e-commerce, you're going to continue to uh, look at those, uh, how that traffic is coming in from Twitter and uh, any kind of viral or email campaigns. Um, so, so I. You know, I want to talk a little bit about analytics, right? Uh, Alex touched on trust is really important. When you go make an online donation, you want to know that it's going to the right organization. It's not fraud. It's not you know, a misspelling of the organization's name and a website somebody threw up and the money is going you know, who the heck knows, right? You want to make sure it's going to the right space. So using analytics, you can test, you know, are, are people trusting my website? What happens if I change the color blue? Uh, does that make people trust me more? Or does PayPal, uh, having the option of PayPal, do more people click the PayPal button? What if I change that PayPal button just to a generic donate button? Uh, what happens? Uh, and you need to be using analytics. And this is probably uh, the second step once you get uh, one of those donation forms installed, whether it's third party or uh, do it yourself, um, is making sure it's efficient. Okay. If you can't measure it, you can't make it better. So you need to be measuring both how is traffic coming in, and then once it comes in, how do you measure 
uh, the donations through the form. Do a lot of people who start on your donation form, do they abandon it? Uh, are you asking too many questions? Are you asking for you know, their favorite color ice cream? or uh, you know, Are you not giving them enough reasons uh, to donate? Um, you can play around with things like your donation giving level. So a lot of uh, form builders and uh, donation widgets will allow you to say, here's some great giving levels. You know, 50 and 100 and 250 dollars, um, and then an option for recurring donations. But it, if you play around with those price points, does it affect how much money is coming in? Um, so it's really, really, really important that you start <laughs> playing around and paying attention to those donation analytics. Um, it's what a lot of the e-commerce companies do, and us as nonprofits, if we're processing transactions online, uh, we need to be paying attention to the exact same stuff. Thank you, Chris. So we have some resources to share, but I'm going to hold on that for a little bit. I want to jump to questions because there's about 20 or so that have stacked up here. And please do send your questions in now. Um, I'm going to get started with a question that I'll give to Chris. Uh, this is from Kim. How much is reasonable to expect to pay for thir third-party vendors? And I know it probably depends, but can you give us kind of a rough overview of the cost um, that, like? Network for Good and PayPal charge. Yeah. So you're really going to be looking at or between two and a half. Well, all right. So PayPal has a, a nonprofit program. I think it's like 1.9 percent, um, and it depends on their product. Uh, there's other ones like First Giving. I think is a seven and a half percent. So there's there's a really big range. Typically, you're looking at two to five percent. You've got a pretty good deal. Um, you better be seeing some really good feature set if you're going to be paying 7.5%. Um, the other part to that is uh, if you're out shopping these things, look at the cost of usability. Right? If, if somebody goes to your website, and sure, maybe you're only paying you know, 2% uh, for some transaction provider, but people don't trust it. It doesn't look trustworthy. It's not branded. Uh, you can't track the analytics. It's not worth it. You need to. It's worth the extra percent to go through and uh, make sure you're getting as many donations online as possible. Um, so look at cost of usability and the cost of uh, handling the data. Right? Does it get emailed to your office manager or your development staff, and are they having to hand enter these donations, or is there some sort of uh, automation into your uh, uh, donor management uh, suite or uh, customer relations. So I'm not sure if either of you can answer this, but uh, I want to put it out there and I'll shoot it to Alex first. Um, can you discuss the state registration requirements for accepting donations? Because I know we all need our 501c3 to be, um, to be able to take donations. I also know that there's some state, re state registration as well. So Alex, do you, do you know that answer? Um, as far as uh, I can speak from the business side, I mean, typically you'd need to have um, an entity set up. In this case, if you're a nonprofit entity, um, you need to file as a nonprofit entity um, or get classified as it. Um, and then from there, you you'd either set up either in some cases a company or some sort of limited liability corporation to protect yourself. Um, in the donation in the nonprofit world, you'd have to file as a nonprofit organization. Each state is a little bit different. Uh, typically, when you register, if you want a little bit more flexibility, you would register in Delaware. If you're in the United States, you would register in Delaware, uh, just because the laws there tend to be more favorable for businesses, and nonprofits are classified um, would also benefit from that as well. Great. Thank yeah, you. Let, oh, let me Chris? jump on to that a little bit too. Uh, so just recently, there's a, cu a couple of law changes. And again, let me, let me say, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an accountant. Okay. Just marketing. How do you get the money in? How do you comply it? Um, I, I think I put it on the resources uh, page, but there is some state compliance stuff. Uh, one of the big perks of using something like Network for Good uh, is they're, they're registered with every state, uh, so you, you are 100% compliant. I never ever have to deal with that um, at all, uh, and the money passes through to you. Great. Thanks for adding that. And we will be following up with lots of 
more with more resources on the PCI compliance that um, that Alex talked about. Um, I'm afraid that's a little too deep for this conversation, and I and I realized uh, while planning this webinar that we need a, a second webinar that will go in a little bit deeper on some of these topics. So watch for that in the upcoming months. There are quite a few questions about the sim the ease of setting up a third party site or getting that set up on your site, especially for small nonprofits that are working with only volunteers. So perhaps Chris, you could take a minute and, and kind of walk us the steps of, you know, perhaps I have a basic website. What do I need to do to get to a place where people can donate to me via w one of those tools that you discussed? And perhaps just pick one that you know is the simplest to, to get started. All right. Well, I'll, I'll use PayPal in this case because I think a lot of organizations use them. So you can log into your PayPal account and they have a button maker. Uh, and you can give, create a button, let's say for uh, a $50 gift. And you can copy and paste that code into your website and call it a day. And it's, it really is about a, you know, two or three lines of you know, geek uh, code, HTML code, uh, and it can go right into your uh, website. If you're using a content management system, so let's say like you're on WordPress or uh, some other thing like Drupal, you can just uh, you you may need somebody to open up the HTML box and uh, paste it into there rather than the regular content portion. Um, and then yeah, again, each of these products have different options. So PayPal, for example, will allow you to customize a form with some of their products. So you can make that full donation form on your website. Um, and you, again, that's it, it, it tends to be technically an embedded uh, iframe, so that the some of the compliance stuff is handled uh, actually on PayPal side, and you're still able to have the form on site. Um, and then you know, go back and copy and paste that code. And one question that relates to this is, these third-party vendors will push you to a different website to capture the credit card information. Is it sometimes difficult for people to get back to the people to the, the original website that they were on? So, I, so for some of these, I think that it's uh, if you set it up right, they'll come right back, um, and it's pretty easy to do so. Uh, what I tell everybody to do is when you're shopping for these things, go look at other people's donation forms. Um, maybe I'll put a list up on my blog of, of some good ones. But go look at donation forms. See what you like. Make a donation to some of these organizations, even if it's for a dollar, just to see what the user flow is like. And you know, I've seen so many people just kind of copy and paste that PayPal code and then kind of never really go through the process themselves of how a donor would see it. Uh, so you know, handle that yourself and then uh, making sure that the follow-up is there. So, you know, once there's a, you wouldn't want to just push them right back to your home page. Maybe you have a custom page that says, "Hey, thanks so much for your gift. We really appreciate it. Your gift supports X, Y, and Z." Uh, and it's a custom landing page. Uh, now, I talked about Google Analytics. You can also use that kind of like post uh, post gift thank you page is what. Uh, inside Google Analytics as your uh, was it target um, for the tracking uh, the success rate of the transaction. So how many people started at the beginning of the donation process and how many finished it? That's a really good point. I want to shoot this over to Alex. Um, the question from Nora is what's the best best for international transactions? Uh, for international transactions. Um, there's certain other providers. I mean, personally, I'm familiar with, uh, with WorldPay. WorldPay can give you several options also, um, whether you want to integrate it into your page or have it some, push someplace else. Um, so there's a bunch of different options there, but in my experience, I've, uh, I've used RBS WorldPay, and it's worked out pretty well. And Chris, what do you know about the third-party vendors and being able to take international donations? Uh, PayPal tends to be the most responsive to that. Um, I, I dealt with a client the other day who was trying to do the shekel, um, or shekling, I guess, and uh, PayPal was able to do it. Um, so in terms of international transaction, probably 
PayPal will handle it. So for people taking small donations, what would be the, the best processing for many small donations? And I guess we can start with, um, with Alex. Um, for, for micropayments, I mean, I think uh, Chris would know better than I would in this, in this case, so I'll, uh, I'll divert to him. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that I, I'd want more information before I fully say, like, here's the solution for you. Um, if, if it's truly micropayments, 2 to $5, um, you know, there's a lot of options out there. And it, like, at that point, you need to think about what's usability and what am I really trying to achieve? Is it the money portion of it, or am I trying – is it part of a more comprehensive uh, plan to get people involved in my organization, um, kind of like a test or gift, uh, so I can follow up and you know add them to our mailing list and uh, connect with them on a, a larger basis? This, oh, thanks for that, um, <clears throat> and thanks everyone for submitting these questions. They're really really great. Um, one about Canvio or Cantera. So before I Ask the full question, um, Chris. Do you know either? Do you know much about either of those programs or applications? Yeah, I, 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 yeah. So uh, both of the, the uh, Kintero is a black well, box. Let me read. Audit. Sorry, I'll just read the question, then you can okay. can respond to the question. So uh, this is from Audra, a small nonprofit in the market to find a team raiser site like Convio or Kintera that would allow us to create our own web page and have people sign up, um, fundraise, and grow their team. Can you recommend an affordable host? I would go look at First Giving Stay Classy and Gives You. As opposed to um, the tools that you yeah. Okay. So if you could explain briefly what those two tools are used for. Yeah, so they tend to be used for larger organizations. They've got some great things for small organizations, but uh, if you're looking for a quick and easy way, I think that those three options uh, or an easy way to get in. And those are those friend asking friends. Uh, I'm going to go do a walkathon or a dogathon or a bike event. That's what those tools are used for primarily. Um, and the other tools are now competing against. Um, so. Great. And um, Nathan had a question about whether this should integrate with their accounting tool like QuickBooks. We talked earlier about it integrating with your um, CRM. So how does it need, do you need to have it connect to your QuickBooks? Uh, is this one for me or Alex? Um, I guess for either. I'm not sure who's the best <laughs> to answer. Yeah, so so, so let, let me jump on that. So uh, it's really important that it, online donations are connected to everything else you're doing, right? Your email newsletter, your uh, regular kind of donor profiling and uh, uh, kind of major gift prospecting, it's important that it's involved in it. So you want to give that data in uh, to your CRM or donor management system and your accounting. And there's lots and lots of options on how to do that. Um, some donor management companies use a PayPal uh, integration um, so that it's automatically reflected. Uh, inside of your CRM, and then it links into your accounting system. Um, so, you know, that that's where you begin starting to want to talk into uh, who's the TechSoup consultant, uh, Robert Weiner, who's an expert in, you know, connecting those systems and making sure they're right for your organization. Um, so, I, I hope I answered that right. Great. And Alex, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, I think that just about covers it. Okay. And um, Chris mentioned Robert Weiner. We were lucky enough to do a webinar with him about a month ago, so I will be sure to include a, a link to that webinar in the post-event survey. It was really pretty great. It was um, what to consider when developing a donor database. Um, so another question has to do with um, the widgets that you discussed earlier, Chris. What are the easiest online donation widgets to install in a blog? Um, you would put in chip in. Were there others that you wanted to mention? Hey, you know what I, I, I always oh. uh, what I always think is interesting is PayPal has some widgets, and nonprofits haven't really traditionally used them. I haven't seen them as being that prominent. Uh, PayPal does have fundraising widgets. 
um, that are branded as theirs. Um, so you can do that through PayPal. Uh, you know, chip in is really easy. Um, I mean, all, all of the sites that I talked about, they put you know, simplicity first, making sure that the you know, nonprofits, they want to focus on their mission, right? We don't want to deal with technical stuff. We're not in the business of running you know, uh, web development firms. We're in the business of solving a social mission, right? So uh, the real goal is making it really easy for our staff to go out and do it. And most of the tools I talked about today will allow you to do that. So Alex, we had, you had talked about um, checking on the reliability of the, um, the trust marks on sites and being able to check on the reliability of, of those sites. Now, do you know much about checking on the reliability of third-party vendors? Uh, typically, the third-party vendors do a pretty good job um, with some of those hosted pages that they use. So when it shoots you out to a, a different uh, domain to do your, your checkout, um, they typically do it include some things like trust marks like I talked about before. Um, so if you look at a couple donation pages, I'm sure you'll see it. Some third-party vendors actually include it um, automatically in a footer, um, which, is all, which is all great practices. Obviously, you don't get the, the ability to move those things around or test different ones. Um, but for baseline things, I think it accomplishes it pretty well. So uh, they do use them. Um, you just have to look for it when you're, when you're signing up and, and what kind of packages you get included. Great, thank you. So a question is a uh, question from Second Life that has to do with the mobile donations that you mentioned earlier, Chris. So, um, <laughs> of course that would come from Second Life. Of course. <laughs> We've got the super techies in Second Life. What mobile donation tools are most effective for SMS donations? Oh, you know, SMS donations could be its own webinar. Um, and I, you know, I would go have people look at mobile giving. Um, they're kind of an SMS service. Um, SMS is kind of expensive to get into, and you need to figure out how to do it right. You know, what's the strategy? Uh, how is it connected to everything else that I'm doing? Um, do I have the, the user base to support it? Uh, just to, to break even on my initial capital expense of setting up the, the service. So. Um, you could start with mobile giving. Uh, there's a bunch of players in the field. You know, if it's something that you're really looking at, um, you know, drop me an email and I'll send you a, a little list of organizations that do it. Okay, great. And it's a, it's a slight bit off topic, um, but we did mention it earlier, so I wanted to ask that question. And last year we did two mobile giving webinars, so I'll include um, both those links as well in the follow-up message. This, mess, or this question um, was so, somewhat answered earlier, but I wanted to um, ask Alex to talk about the price range for that nonprofits should budget for development fees and ongoing support. So just kind of a general idea of what people can be looking for as far as cost when it comes to do-it-yourself. Sure. I mean, that's a great question and definitely something to be considered. Um, when you're setting up everything from scratch, you're looking at about um, – you probably set aside about $500 for um, just getting your payment gateway and your, your relationship with uh, the merchant banks and everything set up. Um, typically, it ranges between $250 to $500 to get that squared away. And also factor in some time there, too. It may take you know, a, a week or two or, or a little bit more to get that set up. Um, as far as the, any development work that needs to be done, um, you, may people have, you may have people already on staff that have those skills, but um, I mean, personally, I just think I would budget anywhere between $1,500 to $2,000 um, to make sure that I have enough set aside so that once I set it up, it's operating, it's running great. I have some money to do uh, to do some testing, um, outsource any other development work that I want to get done, uh, other integration if I want to integrate it, like you said, into other third-party stuff as well, or even you know, fun things like integrating it with Twitter and Facebook. All that stuff also requires development time to do. Not that it's difficult, but um, you know, I would budget around that much for it. But again, it's all about how much you're going to make in return from that. So uh, part of what Chris said in the beginning of the presentation is, is very appropriate, defining exactly what you need to achieve um, for your particular donor base um, and what you're going to need to do will really define which way you're going to go with it. So, but personally, I would probably allot that much money. 
Um, I don't think you'll end up spending all of it, but you'll have enough to fall back on if anything goes wrong. Uh, you'll have people there to fix it. You can pay to have people fix it. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. And thanks, Chris, both of you. This was really great information. I know a lot of information, and again, apologize for not being able to go in deeper, but we will have another one in a few months that goes in deeper um, into this, uh, at least one of these topics. But I wanted to let you know that we've got a page full of resources in the PowerPoint, which you received earlier today. So if you want to open that up, you can start looking at some of these links. But I'll also be sending these links in the follow-up email that you'll receive in a couple of hours. If you have additional questions that weren't answered, you can post those to our fundraising forum. Uh, Becky will be sending out that short URL via the chat. And if you are uh, new to TechSoup, we've got more than just webinars. We've got uh, discussion forums, articles, blogs, uh, discounted software of course, and uh, we post upcoming events. So check out more of what we have to offer on TechSoup.org. Next week, actually in two weeks from today, is our next webinar, Successful Event Promotion with Social Media. I'll be interviewing Janet Faust. I'm very excited. She's a, quite the leader in the area. And also I'd like to thank ReadyTalk. This webinar is made possible by ReadyTalk, which has donated the use of their system to help TechSoup expand awareness of technology throughout the nonprofit sector. ReadyTalk helps nonprofits and libraries in the U.S. and Canada reach geographically dispersed areas and increase collaboration through their audio conferencing and web conferencing services. So again, thanks everyone for attending. And thank you Alex and Chris for the great presentation and answering all those questions. And thanks to Becky for answering the chat questions. Have a great day everyone. If you have any questions, um, you feel free to email me or call me. And take a minute to fill out our post-event survey that will pop up once the webinar closes. So have a wonderful day. Thanks Chris and Alex. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please stand by.